Welcome. Last session of the day, and the most exciting, I'm sure. So hope everybody got coffee, everybody's all caffeinated up, wired, ready to, to learn about converged networking. Taylor was just reminding me that we're the only thing standing between you and liquor. So we better keep this good and exciting, because otherwise you're going to leave us early and get out of here, and we wouldn't want that to happen. So our agenda is pretty straightforward. We're going to talk about virtualized workloads. We're going to talk about the hosting infrastructure. And then we've got a couple other topics that are sprinkled in and around. If we look at what our historical topology for uh, Hyper-V was, we used to have a recommendation of discrete network adapters for each and every type of workload. So what that really meant is that you had a physical NIC for your management, and a lot of times that was teamed. You had a physical NIC for storage. If you were using iSCSI, you'd probably have two or three of them, maybe four. You'd have a physical NIC for migration traffic, a physical NIC for cluster traffic, maybe two of them. And then you'd have some, virtual, some physical NICs that were probably teamed for the virtual machines. So we'd count that up, and we've got like way more NICs than is even reasonable in most environments. And especially if you start talking about those being 10 gig, now you've got you know, a terabyte of traffic coming out of a host. It's just ridiculous. So we've evolved. And now we've moved into a world where we can have things called converged networks. Sometimes they're called software-defined networks. Sometimes they're just called teams. And in this environment, we can have as few as two network adapters that are shared for all of the different workload types together. So we can run our management traffic. We can run our storage traffic. We can run our migration traffic, our cluster traffic, and the virtual machines all over a couple interfaces. How many of you today are running a converged network? Is it working for you? Mostly? That's good to hear. Yeah. Oh, you know what we forgot? Who are you? Oh, yeah. I'm Taylor Brown. I'm a program manager on the Hyper-V team. And I'm Don Stanwick, a program manager on the networking team. And together we do Hyper-V networking. Yeah. Now that we got that out of the way. So we have some other options, too. We have something called RDMA. RDMA is a hardware offload that allows us to get super fast, low latency, low CPU overhead storage traffic. And we can use that for both Hyper-V storage as well as for live migration. Pretty awesome. So now we've got a couple NICs. You could have as few as one. You could have two. You could have four that will run your storage traffic and can run your live migration traffic. And we have one other option. We have SROV. Now we've got it here with RDMA as well. You could have it with RDMA. You could have it without RDMA. And SROV allows us to get super fast, low latency, high throughput uh, networking into the virtual machine. So combine all this together, and we've got a team that we can use for management and VM access and, and clustering and live migration, and we've got RDMA that we can use for storage and live migration, and we've got SRLV that we can assign to VMs, but not all VMs, or all the VMs, or some of the VMs. How do we figure out what to do with these different topologies and these different options? That's what we're here to try to talk through today. We're, trying, we're gonna try to give you the tools to understand what are all these options, when do you use which ones, how do they work together, how don't they work together, and what's the right set of functionality for your environment. So we're going to start off by just talking about some of the virtualization workloads and their demands on the network. How many of you actually tax your network today? Are you running, how many, let me start with another question. How many of you are running one gig infrastructure? If I'm kind of looking around strangers, because they have some bright lights back there and I can't hardly see anybody. One gig, how about 10 gig? Yeah, that's pretty good. Any 40 gig? No 40 gig to the host yet? Oh, they've got one over here. Oh, good. A couple in here. Are I we starting to use that up? So do we need that 40? No? Okay. Well, you'll get there soon enough. I promise you. Because it's like everything else. You can never have enough bandwidth, right? If you don't have enough demand to fill up your pipes, lucky you. It, you got no problems. You can sleep well at night. Networking issues are not your problem. You should be in another session, probably. 
But some of you are running up against that question of how do I use that bandwidth? Because you need some things. You're worried about the throughput, the latency. You're worried about whether things are uh, operating on your east-west network or your north-south network. And you're worried about availability, which takes us to the first topic. Whoops, where'd we go? There we go. Nick Teeming. How many of you use Nick Teeming? How many of you are still using a third-party Nick Teeming? One, two? Three or four over here. Three or four? This is the troublemaker side. Wait, when you guys, when we get done with this session, I would love to hear from you what it is that's keeping you on that third party, because I really want to know, seriously. As, as many of you know who've been coming to these conferences, I delivered Nick Teeming, I, my team delivered Nick Teeming back in Server 2012, and we've had very good reviews, but we know there's a couple things that, that people still want that maybe we need to work on, and we are interested in hearing about that. But for most people, it's working pretty good, and as I saw here, there's not very many people who are still on those third-party uh, teaming solutions. That's cool. So what is Nick Teaming? It's a way to aggregate traffic, get some failover. So here's the other next question. How many of you are still using an active passive or active standby mode? Oh. And he, we need to talk, too, because we need to figure out why you do a thing like that. That's like building a four-lane highway and blocking off one lane in each direction just in case you ever need it because there was an accident in the remaining lane. Right? Okay. It's also a way to expose VLANs and native hosts, but we're not here to talk about native hosts. We're here to talk about Hyper-V. And we all know that we do not use teaming to expose VLANs and Hyper-V, right? What do we use? The VM switch. I'm hearing it. You guys got to talk up. This is a dialogue, not a <laughs> monologue. You're not here to hear, listen to me. I'm here to learn from you. So why do we use it? We want better bandwidth utilization. We want more bandwidth available to the host. And in those rare instances when something fails, we want a way to make sure we still have communication even though something failed. And how well does Nick Teaming get along with the other features in Windows? Very well, right? It's got one small problem in that it doesn't get along real well with either RDMA or SRIOV. Not yet. Maybe, who knows, you know. In my fantasies, someday it will solve the world's hunger problem. But we're not quite there yet. Um, anyway, so if you're using RDMA or you need to do SRIOV, unfortunately, Nick Teaming won't help you there. But with, at least with SRIOV, we have Nick Teaming in the guest, and we'll come back to some of that. And the mode we recommend for all of your solutions, uh, switch independent teaming with dynamic load balancing. There are occasional rare instances where we might recommend uh, switch dependent teaming with Hyper-V port. And we can talk about that sometime if you're interested. I'm around all day tomorrow and Wednesday. You can locate me uh, either by email or on the, show, on the booth floor or wherever. Nick Teaming is managed through PowerShell commandlets. I'm sure you all are in love with PowerShell, giving you scripting capabilities you never dreamed of before. Both the net LBFO commandlets as well as the net adapter commandlets. How many of you have made the mistake of trying one of the net switch commandments? I hope not very many, good. And you also can run the UI, which you just type lbfoadmin.exe, or of course in server manager, there's the little link to click on to get to the next teaming UI. This thing's not always real responsive. So Taylor, how would I do it in VMM? So first off, how many people are using VMM? Good, excellent. How many people know how to do Nick teaming in VMM already? Well, so there's a couple parts to, to VMM. It's not necessarily just as easy as one step of, hey, create me a switch with the team, because there's a couple different aspects. The first thing you have to do is we create a, a logical network definition. And all this really is is a way to say, this is the network I'm going to use, these are the hosts that it's available to, and these are the VLAN, uh, the VLAN it's going to be on. So in this case, I just said, give it to every host and use VLAN zero, 
because this is a demo and that's all I really needed to, to put in there. Then we create an uplink port profile. This is basically a, a way to say these are the, the port profile for the uplink to these hosts. And so you can see in here we said it's a host default, which is going to do the right thing depending on if it's a 2012 or 2012 R2 host. So in 2012 R2, that's going to be dynamic. Uh, in 2012, it'll be Hyper-V port because we didn't have dynamic in Windows Server 2012. And we give it a name. And then finally, we pass that to new system SC logical switch. And we pass the name, the switch uh, uplink mode. And we pass the uh, new SC uplink port profile set with the team and the logical switch. That's all you have to do to create a logical switch that will use a team in VMM. Not too horribly difficult. And once you're done with that, you can recreate that as many times as you need to. As I mentioned, NIC teaming doesn't work with SRIOV. That is, if you create a switch in SRIOV mode, you can't team those adapters. The result is that uh, we did that because it's very difficult to manage those connections in the host when they're being directly loaded to the VM. So what we did instead was we said, great, we'll make teaming work also in the VM. And so you can take a VF or even a network adapter in the VM that's not a VF, and you can team those. That way, if you lose connectivity on the pipe coming into one of your switches, automatically the VM will fail over to the other one. You do have to make sure that you set the allow teaming flags, because otherwise the, switch, the VMs work just like the physical network. As you, most of you are aware, if you have your hosts plugged into a physical switch and the physical switch loses its uplink, your switch doesn't get told. Your host, I mean, doesn't get told. And the same thing happens with the VM switch. If you have VMs plugged into the VM switch and the VM switch loses connectivity, your hosts don't get told unless they've been identified as uh, to allow teaming in that VM, in which case the VM does get told so that it can fail over. Sure. What about support for legacy OSs for that PG 2008 R2? Because there's no third party Microsoft teaming solution for 2008 for legacy OSs. Everything you just said is correct. And there's no current plans that I'm aware of, no current path to get teaming back to 2008 R2 guests. Um, something we can put on our list, we can consider it. I wouldn't hold my breath waiting for it, though. How do all this guest NIC teaming work? It works with other features. It works perfectly. There are, every feature that works in the VM works with guest NIC teaming. And of course, the recommended mode, the same as we use in the host itself. So just a quick slide. This is how you turn it on. So in the UI. There's the bottom checkbox down there, check it. Or through PowerShell, you can say set VM network adapter, allow teaming. <laughs> Pretty straightforward. How many, of you, how many of you have played with guest NIC teaming? Couple? OK. Nice to know it's getting used somewhere. <laughs> so and same thing in VMM. There's just a single checkbox or a PowerShell command which. OK. One of the areas that we get a lot of confusion on is VMQ, RSS, and VRSS. And tomorrow, uh, Gabe will be speaking on networking for particular workloads. And I hope that he will cover this topic again, because I, I don't know how many of you have heard Gabe Silva talk, but he does a good talk on VMQ versus RSS and VRSS. If nothing else, go check out Gabe's blogs, because he's got some good blogs on it as well. What is it? All of these are just ways to distribute the traffic to different processors. Why would you want to do that? Because you can overload a processor. In fact, a typical server processor can do around 3.5 to 5 gigabits per second of networking, and then it runs out of steam. Or as somebody put it to me when I was on Booth Duty earlier today, it melted it down. OK, it didn't literally melt it down, I'm sure, but it gets really hot. You run that CPU very, very hot. So if you can distribute that workload across multiple CPUs, 
you can A, get more bandwidth, and B, keep those CPUs just a little bit cooler. In native mode, we use RSS to do this job. RSS and VMQ make use of the same resources in the NIC, and that's a set of queues. We use those queues that filter inbound traffic in native mode to deliver the traffic to different CPUs for each different TCP stream. In the Hyper-V world, we change those filters to use them to filter for each specific Hyper-V switch V port. And we take each V port and deliver it to different queues. With VRSS, we have the ability to turn around and take that and deliver multiple queues to the same VM in a way that spreads the traffic to multiple logical processors. This then allows us to scale out that VM to a very large number. With SRIOV, we get native RSS working on top of the VF. And that gives us the ability to spread the, the traffic that same way to the multiple logical processors. How's it get along? Well, both RSS and VMQ work with all the other features, of course, except each other, because RSS is in native mode and VMQ is in Hyper-V mode. And in the VM, you're either using RSS or VRSS. You're not using VMQ inside the VM because VMQ is a way to feed the Hyper-V switch. So how do we do that, Taylor? Well, so this is just showing a view of how many VMQs you have on a given uh, network adapter. So we can see that, actually I'll fast forward to the next one here. We can see that on these two physical adapters, these two Intel adapters, each one of them has 63 queues each. And combined, when we create a team, we end up with 126 available queues to the virtual machines. So that means that if you had 126 network adapters hooked up to that, that switch, each one of them would have, would have their own queue. Or to put it another way, every VM, up to 126 of them, or 125 of them plus the default queue, yep. um, 125 VMs would each be getting their own queue, their own traffic sorted out in the hardware and delivered up to the processors for that VM. Now, VMQ, dynamic VMQ came along in Server 2012 R2, and what it does is it actually will aggregate traffic back to a smaller set of processors when there's light traffic, so that the processors that are doing your compute work can do more compute work. But when the networking traffic speeds up, it will redistribute those queues across more processors so to be able to handle the larger load. And it will actually move the load around between processors. So and just in case you ever needed to for some reason, you can also disable and enable VMQ by simply saying disable uh, NetAdapter VMQ or re-enable NetAdapter VMQ. Uh, sometimes that's helpful in troubleshooting scenarios, but generally you should never have to worry about it. It's on by default, and ideally it should stay on. Now, one of the things we can tell from looking at this screen is that the team that is exposing the Fabric Uplink Logical Switch team is in switch independent mode. How do we know that? Because it's in some queues mode. It's summing up the number of queues available from the underlying processors. If it were in a switch-dependent mode, like LACP, it wouldn't be able to because when the switch is determining where to deliver the traffic, the host can't detect where that traffic's going to arrive, and so it has to program the same queues on all of the team members. When switch-independent mode, the host does know where the traffic for each VM port will arrive because we decide it. We make it happen. And in which case, we can make use of more queues. How do we configure the guest VMQ? Really, by default, nothing, because it's on. If you wanted to, you could turn it off. And we actually call out VMQ wait. It's a myth. It's either zero, which means off, or it's something other than zero, which means on. At some point in the future, we might actually use wait. But today, it's either zero or something greater than zero, which is on. But that's basically the, uh, it's on by default, and you should be able to leave it on. In fact, if I hear you're turning it off, except for one particular problem with one particular vendor's NIC in one particular configuration right now, where we're having an issue in the field, some of you may be aware of it, 
Though it's the only time I want to see somebody ever disable VMQ. And that should only come after you've talked to us and made sure that you have that configuration. And no, I'm not going to say here who it is or where it is or how it's going. Okay. Same thing in VMM. It's on by default in all the important profiles. So they've got their default profiles. In this case, I looked at the medium bandwidth one. On by default. If you wanted to enable it for some reason, you can do the enable. If you want to disable it, you could. Again, you shouldn't need to. And the guest gets to turn on virtual RSS? Yeah. Guests can turn it on. So by default, if you go into the guest network adapter, so you can see the properties dialog that I've got here is from a virtual machine inside the guest, the device manager and network configuration. And we can see receipt size scaling. And I've turned it on in that virtual machine. You can also use get net adapter RSS or enable or disable net adapter RSS to see if RSS is turned on in the guest. Yep. Does, does guest RSS help me if I only have one LP for my uh, VM? <laughs> no. So RSS does need to have multiple processors. And it will be most beneficial if you actually are in virtual NUMA configuration where you've got more than four virtual processors. But it will even help in case where you have two or four. Um, but you'll see the biggest benefit percentage-wise if you've got greater than four processors. Yeah, I've got a question. We've heard that discussion question before. Um, obviously, we're not here to talk about futures, but it's something we've heard. The question, just for people who were listening or yes. couldn't hear it, the question was, are you looking at some way to automatically move VMs off of a queue that are lower bandwidth to replace them with VMs that are higher bandwidth, basically get the most bang for the back out of the hardware? And of course, one of the challenges there is that VM that's low bandwidth right now might just be on a short break. And as soon as we move it, immediately it gets hammered. And the moving in and out of a queue takes a very short break on the wire, and packets can get dropped. And so we'd really rather not drop packets, just because we happen to move it and then get hammered and have to try to move it back. And the other way to solve it, and really this is what I've been seeing, is NICs have more queues now. They just we, they keep adding more, right? It went from four queues and eight queues, 16 queues, now it's 256 queues. Um, you put that in a team, you've got 512 queues now. I, I've heard from a few customers that are running 100 VMs on a server, but not too many that are running 500 on one server yet. They'll get there. And, yeah. yes. Yes. Yeah, not too many people are buying those yet either. Okay. Large send offload. This is one of those a little bit more obscure things, but certainly something worth looking at. Large send offload allows the VM to send a large packet down to the NIC, where the NIC chops it up. This is not IP segmentation. This is just the NIC generating the multiple packets for you from that big load you gave it and delivering them out as individual packets. This is very handy, and because we offload some of that CPU processing to the NIC, we get some benefit in the host. Yep. We reduce the stack processing, as the slide says. And LSO gets along with everybody. Yeah, in fact, you probably didn't even realize it's just on, right? So you can see here, pretty much across the board, IPv6, IPv4, it's just there. Don't need to turn it off. Don't need to turn it on, it's just running. Any questions on LSO? Good. Jumbo frames. Well, that's a lot like an LSO, isn't it? The difference is the jumbo frame allows me to deliver that large packet down to the hardware, and then it goes on the wire as a large packet. Couple of things to be careful of. You better know what your end-to-end -end MTU is. Because if you try to send a jumbo frame out through your internet gateway and onto the internet backbone, there's a very good chance you're going to encounter a network where a 9,000 byte frame is not supported. But within your data center, you can enable it on your switches, enable it on your hosts, and you can see a significant savings in CPU utilization. 
This is because the most expensive operation that a host has to do in networking is process that header. And if instead of sending 1,500 byte packets, I can send 9,000 byte packets, I'm only processing one header instead of six to get to 9,000 bytes. So I get a significant savings. How many people have jumbo frames turned on? How many people have jumbo frames turned on who aren't using iSCSI? How who many are not people? using iSCSI? iSCSI likes to use jumbo frames. Yeah, few. And so a lot of people who have iSCSI on use jumbo frames for that. I would hope you're also looking at jumbo frames for your everyday data traffic, yeah. at least with your, in your east-west networks. So a couple of networks that come to mind for me, your storage network. SMB, great. iSCSI, definitely. Live migration traffic, absolutely live migration traffic can benefit from it. So these are a couple areas where I have to turn it on. You've got complete control over that network. Heck yeah, save the, the time. And of course, if you're one of those people who studied hardware and CRC calculations and things like that back in college or something that were back in the dark ages, you know that the probability of error detection on a 9,000 byte frame is ever so slightly lower than it is on a 1500 byte frame, but it's so close that it doesn't really matter. And other than that, it gets along with everything. The only thing is that jumbo frames within the Hyper-V switch are not necessarily always going to be supported. How do you find out what your path MTU is, Taylor? You ping, and you use the minus L switch with a size, and you specify the host that you're gonna to talk to. It'll either succeed or it'll fail. And if it fails, usually what I'll try is I'll try a slightly lower one and just see, is there some magic number, 9,000, 8,000 that it's running at? And then I can go figure out which switch I need to go fix to make it work with 9014. And, and there's a couple of different common numbers that are used for jumbo frames. One's about 4096, one is 9014. Um, check around and see what your NIC supports, who your switches support, because it's actually possible that everything supports jumbo frames, but none of them support the same sizes. And some of them also keep the header and the payload separate, so sometimes you'll see 9032 and 9014, and they can be used interchangeably, because one's calculating the header and saying 9014 plus header is 9032. So other people say, no, 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 it's only the payload size. Just something to be aware of. Oh, yes. yes. Ping no True. fragment. Yeah. Yep. So, so to turn it on in a VM, all you have to do is go in and say net adapter properties, size of uh, the packet 9014 or 4096, we support either one, or through PowerShell, the registry keyword jumbo packet and the value 9014. Pretty simple. Okay, any questions? Not on that one. Okay. Nope. We got one right oh, here. Oh, over here, yes. Oh, hi, there he is, go ahead. This is in the virtual machine. It, it needs to be on in the physical NIC as well. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's part of the whole path link MTU. You've gotta have it all the way from the virtual machine to the physical NIC to the physical switch, to any other physical switches, to the destination machine. Whole path. What yeah. about the virtual switch? Aha, uh -huh. so the virtual switch automatically figures out that, hey, this guest got, vir got jumbo frames turned on, let's turn it on. It, it'll take care of it automatically. Yep. Yes. I haven't heard that, but there's a part of me that wouldn't have any trouble believing that there is somewhere out there a switch that's like that. The question was that the gentleman had heard somewhere that some switches handled jumbo frames in software instead of in their hardware. And I have not encountered that. I don't know if you have. I haven't. I, I think all the modern ASICs are pretty, pretty robust. Okay, so there, the claim is that there are some switches where if you use jumbo frames, you'll drop the performance of the entire network. Uh, yeah. 
Obviously, this is something you would want to do some investigation on in your network uh, before turning it on. If you're running with modern switches and modern NICs, you shouldn't have an issue. But obviously, this was something that kind of came in over time, primarily came in on the piggybacking on top of iSCSI. And there's probably still some older equipment out there that has some very interesting operating characteristics, I guess we'd say. So test it carefully. Uh, it can save you quite a bit of CPU utilization, but there are some risks. So SRIOV. This is a way of getting packets extremely quickly to and from the guest. We like SRIOV a lot, although, of course, you can't take an SRIOV NIC and team it and keep the SRIOV capabilities. But when you do do SRIOV and you put that VF up in that VM, you get really efficient, fast, low latency networking. It bypasses the OS, delivers the packets directly. It doesn't go across the VM bus. It just goes directly to the uh, VM. And then you can use RSS on top of the VF, the virtual function that SRIOV puts inside the guest. And why do you want to use it? You've got a VM that absolutely needs a lot of network traffic. It needs it low latency, and it's consuming a lot, and you don't want to use as much of the host resources to get it there. That's a good candidate for SRIOV. There's a couple of things you really have to be careful of with SRIOV, though. The first one is, it, besides it doesn't play well with teaming, is that if you want things like ACLs or VM QOS to work, you can't use SRIOV. Remember, the data path is completely bypassing the host. So there's, it doesn't go through the switch. So all these things you put on the switch aren't there. So what, Win what Windows does is if you turn on an ACLs or you turn on VM QOS, it cancels the SRIOV path and drives all the traffic back through the host. Because you don't have ACLs or VM QOS, SRIOV should only be given to a trusted VM. That VM now has free opportunity to pound on your network, to go talk to anybody. They're pretty free. So you might want to just give it to trusted VMs. And there's one other small side effect that you need to be aware of that actually I just found out very recently because I got a customer call on it and in trying to debug it, what I discovered was when you have SRIOV enabled on the switch, you cannot have more VMs created in VMM than you have uh, queues for SRIOV. It actually will fail the creation of the VM in SEVMM if you try to create that VM and put it on that switch. Now, again, as Taylor noted a minute ago, these days we have lots of queues. And most of the time, you're going to have far more queues than you're going to have VMs, and so it's not an issue. But if you're using an older adapter that has a limited number of SRIOV queues, and you want to put it into your 40 or 80 VM host, you could run into this problem. The way that SRIOV drives it, as you can see, the VF gets created in the NIC, and the VF guest piece, kind of a kind of two-piece piece, it gets created up in the VM. Yes, question? That's correct. Which one? VMQs and SRIOV queues. In an SRIOV capable VM switch, VMQs and SRIOV queues are the same thing. So you can't do more VMs than queues. And your queues might be currently used for SRIOV or currently used for VMQ, but they're one and the same. Got another one here. Got a question. Yes. Uh, not in the guest, in the, only in the host. Yeah. You set them on the host. As, it, That's because the host actually sets the MAC filter yep. that drives the VF. Yeah. So what happens is when we create the VF down in the, the physical network adapter, 
when we go to create that operation, we say, hey, and this is the, the MAC address, and this is the, VM, or the VLAN, and a few other parameters when that's created. But you yep. could use only one VLAN and one MAC on that VF. OK? And that's, again, trying to scope down what that VM can or can't do over that path. You can't do it in the guest. You have to start by creating the VM switch as an SRIOV switch. Then you attach an SRIOV NIC to that SRIOV switch. Um, and at that point, if you decide to add another NIC and team it, SRIOV will not be reported to the switch and no VFs will be created. VFs are created under the control of the switch, not under the control of the VM. Other questions? Nope. Got one more over here. No oh, one. Yes. 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 You can create your team in the guest on top of those two VFs. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Yep. That would be the way that. If so, I was configuring SIRV, that's the only way I would do it, because I need teaming for liability, right? And in fact, at that point, you take two 40 gig SRIOV capable NICs, you put both of the VFs up there, and you turn on RSS across the 64 logical processors you have in that VM, <laughs> and you go to town. OK? How do we turn it on? So when we create a new switch, we say enable IOV. Pretty straightforward. There's one really nice little trick here, git VM switch, and you can get the name, the IOV support, and IOV support reasons. What IOV support reasons will tell you is, this is the reason we couldn't enable IOV, either it wasn't enabled in the hardware, the, the NIC doesn't support it, uh, any reason that IOV couldn't be enabled. Really simple way to get, to get any information about it. So I always say enable IOV, and then I'll run this just to make sure, yep, it got enabled. Yeah, everything's working the way I expected to. Question, yeah? Uh huh. No, so when you create a, uh, a new virtual switch, you have to give it a, uh, a physical NIC or a team that you're going to use. In the case of IOV, it needs to be a physical NIC that supports IOV when you create that switch. Yep. No, nope. if you have two NICs that both support IOV, but you put teaming on top of them, the virtual NIC that's on top of the team will not report to the switch that it has IOV capabilities. Yeah. You can try to turn it on, and if you go get the support reason, it'll say disabled, NIC doesn't support it. And in VMM, uh, so this is the wrong, oh, sorry, in Hyper-V, this is for a virtual machine. Um, we can again set the IOV weight, and we can set whether or not we wanted to have an IOV interrupt moderation. Just set it, leave it default. This is some performance tweaking you can do to adjust how much the IOV uh, interrupts get delivered down. And you can have how many pairs are requested. Why would I care about how many pairs? RSS. I might want more pairs of IOV for RSS enabled guests. So if I've got a 64 processor machine, I might want more IOV pairs in that guess. In SCVMM, again, we create our logical switch and we say the enable SIROV or we check the box. So that'll create a, a logical switch with IOV. And then for the NIC, new or set SC virtual network adapter native port profile. That really flows. Enable SIROV. Or we just check the box. Pretty straightforward. They also have a nice SIROV pro profile that's already pre-created that has everything you need. And then for the guest, we can do git sc port profile classification where name equals whatever the name you used before, and set sc network adapter port classification, and we use the port classification that was returned by the first thing. Or we just use the drop-down box and say, this is the 
support profile I want. Yep. So, as we said at the beginning, if you have a lot of demand on your network, or excuse me, low demand on your networking, lucky you. And if you have high demand, go back through this, look at the features for each of the different categories. You notice that some features really only work on inbound traffic, like VMQ. SRIOV goes both ways. And Nictimi, of course, gives you the best bandwidth outbound. It doesn't really affect your inbound bandwidth. And for availability, of course, Nick Teaming is there. And that's it. So let's go on to the hosting infrastructure. What can you tell us about that, Taylor? So our, our, serv our network has a couple services that it really provides. We provide bandwidth management for things like management networks and live migration networks and storage networks and all these different things. We, and we need to be able to manage that bandwidth in an appropriate way. If we don't, if it's just the wild, wild west, well, you know what? Live migration will saturate a 80 gig SIROV or R, uh, RDMA NIC. If you let it be, it will completely saturate a network. You'll have no storage throughput. That's not what we want. Similarly, if you leave it the wild, wild west, your VMs can completely saturate the network to the point where you can't manage anything. So to, to address that, we want to use bandwidth management techniques. And one thing I'm going to call out a lot of the SMB configuration, there's an entire session on that just tomorrow. There's a, Jose's got an hour and 15 minutes. He and I were talking before this. He can't even cover all of the different things that, that SMB has in his hour and 15. So we decided in this session we're just not going to cover too, in too much depth the SMB portion. Instead, I would really highly recommend if you're looking at SMB to attend his session or read through his blog or watch it on demand, whatever it may be. Quality of service. We have two flavors of quality of service in Server 2012 R2. We have a software version we usually refer to as VM QOS, and we have a hardware version that we refer to as DCB, or Data Center Bridging. I'm just going to refer to them here as the hardware and software versions. The hardware QOS cannot be set up today under Hyper-V Switch. So you have to make a choice. In your native mode, you'll be using DCB. If you're using RDMA, you almost certainly have to use DCB. Make sure your network is configured all the way across. The number one reason we get calls for RDMA because it's not working is because somebody's trying to use Rocky and has not turned on PFC all the way across their network. PFC, of course, being one of the DCB standards. That's priority flow control for right. the unacronymed of us. <laughs> Why do you want to use it? I think Taylor said it well. VMs can act in very unreliable, untrustworthy manner. And even the, guests, even the services within your host can try to use bandwidth far beyond what they ought to be allowed to if you leave it to the, for them to decide on their own. Because like everybody else, they're just hungry, and as long as there's room to go, as long as they're still throttled left on between the pedal and the floor, they're going to keep pushing it until they use up everything that's there. So we're going to use software quas to manage the bandwidth allocations at the VM, basically, um, and to share the NIC or NICs that are into that VM switch in a nice way. And we'll use hardware quas or DCB to manage native NICs, including your RDMA NICs or any NICs you've got that are over on the um, host partition. A couple of things to watch out for. Obviously, you can't use, as I mentioned, VM quas or software quas and hardware quas on the same NIC at the same time. We don't enable that today. So in software quas, we have a uh, two ways you can configure it. You can configure it with relative weight. This is a very handy way to do it. It's the way we recommend today. Or you can do it with an absolute bandwidth settings, minimums and maximums. The difference is significant when you start to migrate, because your switch has to be set up as either being a weight-based quas switch or an absolute-based quas switch. And you can't migrate VMs between those two kinds of switches. So 
you have to decide up front which one you want to use. If you try to move a absolute weight, an absolute bandwidth VM to a host where there is no room on its neck to meet the, the uh, requirements that you've set for that VM, it will fail the migration. If you use weights, it won't fail the migration. It will just adjust everybody proportionally and fit it in. Of course, that means that you can end up overloading that and nobody's going to get the bandwidth that you thought you had as a minimum. So if you're actually charging for bandwidth, you probably want to use absolute. If you're just trying to make sure that your more important VMs get more bandwidth than your less important VMs, and you don't actually care what the absolute bit rates are, weights are a better choice. And one important note on that, once a virtual switch is created with a mode, it stays in that mode. If you want to recreate it, you have to remove the switch and re-add it with the different, the different mode. So when we, want to, when we go create a new switch, we say minimum bandwidth mode, either absolute, weight, none, or default. And default is uh, weight. There's another couple things we can do. We can set the default minimum bandwidth or default minimum bandwidth weight. So that means any new virtual NIC that comes onto that uh, switch, that's the weight it's gonna have by default, unless someone overrides it. So this is pretty handy. I can say, all right, my default weight's gonna be five. All VMs are five, unless they're, I specify otherwise. If it's more important, make it a 10. If it's less important, I'll make it a one or a two. Um, you do wanna keep these ranges relatively close. So you don't wanna have a VM that's at a weight of 100 and a bunch of VMs that are at weight of two or three. Because the weight disparity will create, uh, will basically starve the lower weight VMs. The, the one that has a weight so high of 100 will end up getting significantly more traffic to the point where the other ones probably don't get enough traffic to even really communicate on the network. Um, on a VM network adapter, we can set the maximum bandwidth. We can set the maximum bandwidth absolute or the maximum bandwidth weight. Or we can set it in the UI. Now you'll note that in the UI we actually use the absolute. That's what the, uh, the UI has been programmed for. In VMM, set SC network adapter native port profile again, our, our favorite commandlet. And again, we can say maximum bandwidth, minimum bandwidth absolute, minimum bandwidth weight. Also, we can set it on the host. They support the ability to go on the host and say network per percentage reserve. And that ends up translated into a weight in their world. There's another form, we talked about the hardware. So if we're using hardware quality of service, we're using DCB, we have to tell the VM that it's allowed to, can, to use DCB. This should be done on trusted VMs because they're actually communicating their priority through the virtual switch down to your physical network. So if you've got a VM that's completely untrusted, it can lie. It can say, no, my traffic is really, really, really important. And, it, and your physical network will say, okay, I got a, a tag from this VM that said it's really important and it will treat it as such. So be, be a little careful um, of the type of VMs that you would enable this on. But set VM network adapter, IEEE priority tag on or off. And to do that in PowerShell for your native NICs, you use the set net quas PowerShell commandlets. And in VMM, uh, newer set SC virtual network adapter native port profile and allow IEEE priority tagging true or false or the checkbox. Live migration. Oh, question, sure. If you enable SIRV, does it automatically disable uh, I, the IEEE, the DCB? It, yes, so software again, with SIRV, software quality of service is not, they don't play well together because you're not going through the virtual switch. There's no place for us to apply that quality of service. So in fact, if I remember correctly, we disable SIRV if you turn it on. So we take the safer path. If you say, nope, this NIC is only allowed, it's got a weight of 10, and you say SIRV is on, we will disable SIRV for that NIC because you set a quality of service policy on it. Another question over here. Go back.
Uh, let's see, how far back? No. Okay. Yeah. So the question is, they've got an issue with the Emulex adapters yeah. and uh, ETS and VMQ. Let, let's talk afterwards. I, I'll need to get some specifics and follow up with uh, Emulex to see what their intentions are. We have friends at Emulex we can call and get that answer, find out why they're saying that. Question I, back I, to I, Off the top of my head, I don't have the answer for you, but I'm happy to look into it. Yeah, I think they're pretty close, is the honest answer. Um, so we, I went back and forth with the VMM team. We, we ended up quabbling over one or two numbers. At the end of the day, I think they're, they're perfectly fine for the most case. You may need to tune them, and that's up to your environment, but I wouldn't be tuning them more than four or five values out, out of each way. Any other questions before we move forward? So live migration. Does anybody not know what live migration is? Good, okay. So in Hyper-V, we support three different transport options for live migration. We have TCP, and this is as of 2012 R2. TCP, which is our old standby. We have compression, which is on by default, which means we compress all of the memory contents as we're sending it over to the other side, and then uncompress them on the destination, and SMB. Now there's a common misconception that SMB is only to be used when you have RDMA. That is false. It certainly helps if you have RDMA, but you can actually benefit from SMB even without RDMA. If you have multiple network adapters, we will spread the load using SMB multi-channel across the multiple adapters, even if they're not RDMA enabled. That can be very beneficial. So keep that in mind as you're looking at different options. If you've got two 10 gig adapters, that may be a very valuable thing to do to expose two live migration networks and turn on SMB. The reason we have compression on by default, all of our experiments told us that compression was the best algorithm overall. That meant, as we looked at various hardware topologies, most people at that time didn't have a bunch of 10 gig adapters and didn't have multiple adapters for, our, for SMB. But it certainly beat TCP in every test we had. We vary the compression rate based on the amount of CPU that's available on the host. So if a host is really, really busy, we don't compress a whole lot. If the host is pretty idle, we compress the heck out of it. And what we found is that our performance of live migration was better almost across the board with compression in every scenario than with TCP. Um, how well does this get along with other technologies? Perfectly fine. It's gonna take advantage of uh, any sort of DCB or um, other quality of service you have enabled. Um, it will work with, with SMB, RDMA, SMB Direct, all of those things, no problem. To set the number of migrations and the compression, you can use the UI or you can use PowerShell. Now the number of, uh, maximum number of migrations is an interesting value to look at. At first glance it might seem like the higher the, the number the better. It's not necessarily true. By default, I think we set it for two which is almost not, never the right number. Usually I think in most environments it's probably a little higher. We left it with two because that was the default that we had for a long time and we didn't want to go changing it on people behind their back. In most environments I think four or eight is a reasonable number. If you want to saturate a 20 gig NIC, you set it to 16. You want to completely saturate your network, turn it up. What actually ends up happening though is you turn it up, and you turn up the number and we saturate the network, the total migration actually takes longer because we have to retry more packets, we have to resend more memory across that gets modified. So what you really want is you want it to just barely edge the top of where you're comfortable uh, with utilization. So if you said live migration should use at most five gig, increase the number until you hit about four and a half gig. And that's a pretty good stable place to have the maximum migration count. In SCVMM, we can set this through uh, set SC host, enable live migration, maximums, uh, the migration protocol authorization, and uh, performance. 
as well as the subnet that's allowed to use for migration. So this is how we can control what networks we're going to use. Storage migration. This is one that people often don't think about, but this allows us to move the virtual machine storage. Now what's important about this is that all the migration traffic goes through the host that initiated the migration, or the host that the VM is running on. So what that means is it's going to read every single byte from the storage that it's on, and it's going to write that to the new storage while I.O. operations are going on. So this can be a fairly long-running, expensive operation, depending on how big the storage is, how many writes are going to it. So you need to keep that in mind when you're looking at how much bandwidth you're going to allocate for storage migration. You want to make sure that it's in line with, uh, with your network and how big those virtual machines are and how fast you care about getting them migrated across. And again, we can set the maximum number of storage migrations. So this is another area where you want to do a little tweaking. And again, I think the default is two. And I actually think in most cases that's, actually it's four, sorry. In most cases, that's actually probably the right number. Because if you go much beyond that, you're copying a lot of data concurrently. And again, we have to sit there and go, oh, someone wrote to that, that portion of, of the storage. We've got to bring that back all over it and write it back down again. So we're duplicating the amount of data we're copying. So four is probably a pretty good number for your storage migrations in most environments. In VMM, same thing. We can do set SC host, live migration maximum. One additional area I wanted to make sure we covered was SMB bandwidth limits. And what this is is basically quality of service for SMB. So we talked about how we can do live migration over SMB. We can do virtual machines over SMB. We also have things like provisioning. We're copying a virtual hard disk down to a, a, a storage. That all goes over SMB. All these things going over one protocol, how do we do quality of service against that protocol? Because it all looks like the same kind of traffic? Well, that's what SMB bandwidth limits allow us to do. It allows us to manage the bandwidth between three different types of SMB traffic. Virtual machines, which is a VM that's using a virtual hard disk that's on an SMB share, live migration, and default. And default rules provisioning or file copies or anything else that you're doing from that host. How does this get along with others? Works with SMB multi-channel, works with SMB direct, works with RDMA. It actually works with software quas. It actually works with DCB as well. So it's all done within the uh, within the server. Turn it on. It's off by default. You just add this feature. Uh, got a question here? Well, when you might not want to use storage migration? If you had a very slow connection between the two storage nodes, maybe not. If you didn't care about the VM being on while you did the migration, so if you had an outage window, Let's say you, know, you could take the workload down for three hours at night and no one was going to care. It's almost always going to be faster to just copy the virtual hard disk over than it is to live migrate it. Um, those are about the only cases I can really think of when, it, when I wouldn't be using it. Question in the middle here. If you have multiple network adapters and you've got bandwidth on all of them, generally SMB is going to be a little faster. Yeah. So that's probably the direction I would go. So the compression ratio has changed at, at com computation time based on the amount of CPU demand on the host. So sometimes we compress the heck out of stuff. Sometimes we're going to do less compression just based on the, uh, there's a couple factors, the CPU load and actually how much we're retrying stuff. So if we're having to send a lot more dirty pages back over, brown pages, then we'll actually adjust the, the compression algorithm down a little bit so that we can copy more data quickly. Uh, so virtual machines that use all their memory, it actually turns out they still get compressed pretty well. That's what we found. We, we can get up to, I'm trying to remember, it's either four to one or eight to one compression, even on heavily loaded workloads, because there's actually a lot of zeroed pages in memory most of the time in almost every workload. 
and we compress zeros very, very efficiently because they're just zeros. So we actually get fairly efficient compression algorithms. We actually use the same compression algorithm we do for save states. So if you wanted to kind of figure out how compressed something could be, save the VM and look at how much memory, how much disk it's used after it's saved. That would give you an idea of what we could compress out of it. Any more questions on this? One more here. Yeah. Why should we use SMB if RDMA is not, or? So SMB is going to give you a benefit if you've got multiple adapters that you can use for it. You need to make sure you expose two interfaces back over to, to take advantage of it. Actually, SMB detects that it's on top of a team and we'll use uh, multiple streams, runs multi-channel to the single interface so that we can do spreading of the load across the team members. Yes. Generally, yeah. As long as you've got bandwidth available, yeah. Compression's gonna use less bandwidth, but if we have bandwidth available, SMB's gonna be faster. Most of the time. Yeah. Any other questions before we? Can we do compression over SMB? We Potentially could. We actually did some experiments and we found that most of the time for SMB, compression wasn't actually that beneficial because we were transferring the data so much faster than we could possibly compress it that the CPUs became a bottleneck. So for example, if we want to, we, can, we literally can saturate an 80 gig RDMA environment. Two 40 gig RDMA interfaces on the right server, we've been able to saturate those just doing live migration. The limitation ends up being the interrupts available and the PCI express bandwidth on the server, which is kind of a great place to be. I like when hardware is letting us down because then I can go look at the hardware guys and say, hey, give us faster hardware. They're working on it. They're working yeah. on it. You gotta keep up. Okay. So back to our bandwidth limits. So we can add the feature and for the different categories, live migration, virtual machine, and default, we can set a bytes per second maximum. So in this case, I said live migration gets one gigabit, or well, less than one gigabit, 100 megabit, and virtual machines get five gigabits a second. Pretty straightforward. So really the key message for the hosting infrastructure is manage your bandwidth. I mean, we talked mostly about different types of quality of service. This is really the key message that I, I from my standpoint, and I think Don as well, you gotta manage the bandwidth. Converged networking falls apart when the bandwidth isn't managed. It works great when it is managed, but as soon as you have unmanaged points, it will fall apart. And it will be the thing that you get a phone call at three o'clock in the morning saying, hey, this thing is down, what's going on? That's been my experience. That's been the experience I've heard from a, a lot of the customers I've talked to. Couple great resources. So we've got a white paper, network recommendations for, Hyper, for a Hyper-V cluster and Windows Server 2012. The same content pretty much works with 2012 R2. Replace Hyper-V port with uh, dynamic, and pretty much the same content will apply. We also have two great uh, deployment documents, one for Server 2012 R2 and one for Server 2012 on Nick Teaming. And there's a great session from Last Tech Ed on what's new in Windows Server 2012 R2 networking. If you want to get into the nitty gritty of how some of these things work under the covers, uh, I would definitely recommend taking a look at that on demand. Some related content. There's a number of good sessions coming up here, and I see Gabe standing over here. Bob Combs is in the audience too, or at least he was earlier. Um, these guys have got some great content. Jose's content tomorrow, of course. I'm sure you guys are all familiar with these names. They're great speakers. They'll bring really good value. Um, look through this. If these are not on your schedule right now, you might want to consider putting them on your schedule if you're interested in good networking. And, and of course, all the obligatory ones. Complete an evaluation. Now, we're not like your local car dealer people. We don't get paid based on our evaluations, but there are bragging rights in Microsoft, and we love to get good evaluations. Yeah. So I guess I'd leave you with, if you don't think we got fives today, come tell us. If you did, then go tell the machine. And if you have anything, if there's sessions you'd like to have, 
put it in the comments. If you're like, hey, you know what, I'd really like to have more deep dive into this area or that. I don't care if it's about anything. You want to have a deep dive on the UI of Hyper-V. Put it in the comments, because that's an easy way for us to go take it back next year and say, hey, we want a session on this. We've got comments from our, from our customers last year, and we'll get the session. Otherwise, we have to go fight for it. And you guys actually become the tiebreaker on most of those kind of uh, decisions. So Taylor and I will be up here afterwards. We'll also then be at the reception, and of course we'll be around the booth tomorrow. I've got, uh, I'm gonna be sneaking into the back of Gabe's session tomorrow afternoon, but until then I'll be around, going back and forth between the booth area and hanging around in the hallways. Um, you can always reach me at don.stanwick at microsoft.com. Yep, and I am either taylorb at microsoft.com or taylor.brown at microsoft.com. Take your pick. They and give work. us a yell. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Welcome. Last session of the day, and the most exciting, I'm sure. So hope everybody got coffee, everybody's all caffeinated up, wired, ready to, to learn about converged networking. Taylor was just reminding me that we're the only thing standing between you and liquor. So we better keep this good and exciting, because otherwise you're going to leave us early and get out of here, and we wouldn't want that to happen. So our agenda is pretty straightforward. We're going to talk about virtualized workloads. We're going to talk about the hosting infrastructure. And then we've got a couple other topics that are sprinkled in and around. If we look at what our historical topology for uh, Hyper-V was, we used to have a recommendation of discrete network adapters for each and every type of workload. So what that really meant is that you had a physical NIC for your management, and a lot of times that was teamed. You had a physical NIC for storage. If you were using iSCSI, you'd probably have two or three of them, maybe four. You'd have a physical NIC for migration traffic, a physical NIC for cluster traffic, maybe two of them. And then you'd have some, virtual, some physical NICs that were probably teamed for the virtual machines. So we'd count that up, and we've got like way more NICs than is even reasonable in most environments. And especially if you start talking about those being 10 gig, now you've got you know, a terabyte of traffic coming out of a host. It's just ridiculous. So we've evolved, and now we've moved into a world where we can have things called converged networks. Sometimes they're called software-defined networks. Sometimes they're just called teams. And in this environment, we can have as few as two network adapters that are shared for all of the different workload types together. So we can run our management traffic. We can run our storage traffic. We can run our migration traffic, our cluster traffic, and the virtual machines all over a couple interfaces. How many of you today are running a converged network? Is it working for you? Mostly? That's good to hear. Yeah. It's a way to aggregate traffic. Get some failover. So here's the other next question. How many of you are still using an active passive or active standby mode? Oh. And he, we need to talk, too, because we need to figure out why you do a thing like that. That's like building a four-lane highway and blocking off one lane in each direction just in case you ever need it because there was an accident in the remaining lane. Right? OK. It's also a way to expose VLANs and native hosts, but we're not here to talk about native hosts. We're here to talk about Hyper-V. And we all know that we do not use teaming to expose VLANs and Hyper-V, right? What do we use? The VM switch. I'm hearing it. You guys got to talk up. This is a dialogue, not a <laughs> monologue. You're not here to hear, listen to me. I'm here to learn from you. So why do we use it? We want better bandwidth utilization. We want more bandwidth available to the host. And in those rare instances when something fails, we want a way to make sure we still have communication even though something failed. And how well does Nick Team get along with the other features in Windows? Very well, right? It's got one small problem in that it doesn't get along real well with either RDMA or SRIOV. Not yet. Maybe, who knows, you know. In my fantasies, someday it will solve the world's hunger problem. But we're not quite there yet. Um, anyway, so if you're using RDMA or you need to do SRIOV, unfortunately, Nick Teaming won't help you there. But with, at least with SRIOV, we have Nick teaming in the guest, and we'll come back to some of that. And the mode we recommend 
for all of your solutions, uh, switch independent teaming with dynamic load balancing. There are occasional rare instances where we might recommend uh, switch dependent teaming with Hyper-V port. And we can talk about that sometime if you're interested. I'm around all day tomorrow and Wednesday. You can locate me uh, either by email or on the, show, on the booth floor or wherever. Nick teaming is managed through PowerShell commandlets. I'm sure you all are in love with PowerShell, giving you scripting capabilities you never dreamed of before. Both the net LBFO commandlets as well as the net adapter commandlets. How many of you have made the mistake of trying one of the net switch commandments? I hope not very many. Good. And you also can run the UI, which you just type LBFO admin.exe, or of course in server manager, there's the little link to click on to get to the next teaming UI. This thing's not always real responsive. So Taylor, how would I do it in VMM? So first off, how many people are using VMM? Good, excellent. How many people know how to do Nick teaming in VMM already? Well, so there's a couple parts to, to VMM. It's not necessarily just as easy as one step of, hey, create me a switch with the team. Because there's a couple different aspects. The first thing you have to do is we create a, a logical network definition. And all this really is is a way to say, this is the network I'm going to use, these are the hosts that it's available to, and these are the VLAN, uh, the VLAN it's going to be on. So in this case, I just said, give it to every host and use VLAN zero, because this is a demo and that's all I really needed to, to put in there. Then we create an uplink port profile. This is basically a, a, a way to say, these are the, the port profile for the uplink to these hosts. And so you can see in here we said it's a host default, which is going to do the right thing depending on if it's a 2012 or 2012 R2 host. So in 2012 R2, that's going to be dynamic. Uh, in 2012, it'll be Hyper-V port because we didn't have dynamic in Windows Server 2012. And we give it a name. Infrastructure. If I'm kind of looking around strangers because they have some bright lights back there and I can't hardly see anybody. One gig? How about 10 gig? Yeah, yeah that's pretty good. Any 40 gig? No 40 gig to the host yet? Oh, they've got one over here. Oh, good. A couple in here. Are I we starting to use like that up? So do we need that 40? No? Okay. Well, you'll get there soon enough. I promise you. Because it's like everything else. You can never have enough bandwidth, right? If you don't have enough demand to fill up your pipes, lucky you. It, you got no problems. You can sleep well at night. Networking issues are not your problem. You should be in another session, probably. But some of you are running up against that question of how do I use that bandwidth? Because you need some things. You're worried about the throughput, the latency. You're worried about whether things are uh, operating on your east-west network or your north-south network. And you're worried about availability, which takes us to the first topic. Whoops. Where'd we go? There we go. Nick Teaming. How many of you use Nick Teaming? How many of you are still using a third party Nick Teaming? One, two? Three or four over here. Three or four? This is the troublemaker side. Wait, when you guys, when we get done with this session, I would love to hear from you what it is that's keeping you on that third party because I really want to know, seriously. As, as many of you know who've been coming to these conferences, I delivered Nick Teaming, I, my team delivered Nick Teaming back in Server 2012, and we've had very good reviews, but we know there's a couple things that, that people still want that maybe we need to work on, and we are interested in hearing about that. But for most people, it's working pretty good, and as I saw here, there's not very many people who are still on those third-party uh, teaming solutions. That's cool. So what is Nick Teaming? Oh, you know what we forgot? Who are you? Oh, yes. Yeah. I'm Taylor Brown. I'm a program manager on the Hyper-V team. And I'm Don Stanwick, a program manager on the networking team. And together we do Hyper-V networking. Yeah. <laughs> now that we got that out of the way. So we have some other options, too. We have something called RDMA. RDMA is the hardware offload. It allows us to get super fast, low latency, low CPU overhead storage traffic. And we can use that for 
both Hyper-V storage as well as for live migration. Pretty awesome. So now we've got a couple NICs. You could have as few as one. You could have two. You could have four that will run your storage traffic and can run your live migration traffic. And we have one other option. We have SROV. Now we've got it here with RDMA as well. You could have it with RDMA. You could have it without RDMA. And SIROV allows us to get super fast, low latency, high throughput uh, networking into the virtual machine. So combine all this together and we've got a team that we can use for management and VM access and, and clustering and live migration. And we've got RDMA that we can use for storage and live migration. And we've got SIROV that we can assign to VMs, but not all VMs or all the VMs or some of the VMs. How do we figure out what to do with these different topologies and these different options? That's what we're here to try to talk through today. We're, trying, we're going to try to give you the tools to understand what are all these options, when do you use which ones, how do they work together, how don't they work together, and what's the right set of functionality for your environment. So we're going to start off by just talking about some of the virtualization workloads and their demands on the network. How many of you actually tax your network today? Are you running, how many, let me start with another question. How many of you are running one gig?